Thanks, Phil. Welcome back, everyone. How you doing? Good, mate. Yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting week. A uh, really long Wednesday evening recording the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it seems like a bit of a weird end of the world situation going on with the amount of snow and frost outside my window and and nobody out there so yeah strange week but uh, how about you what have you been up to uh well don't mean to drop it in there but it's my birthday saturday so i've been off work for a day and a half nearly just been drinking uh not doing much else apart from drinking we did a quiz yesterday and i beat you to third place on one of the quizzes uh, on one of the three yeah well done. yeah and the other two i think you actually beat me to third place but i mean it doesn't matter um you've got to take a win that was the only one that counted one was a warm-up one was a warm down um yeah no but it's been good been doing some stuff for the pod we've been planning for the future for once which is not yeah, uh, busy boys aren't we busy boys this week very busy boys so there's some exciting stuff coming up watch this space um but yeah wednesday night was long but it was a good long uh um, was a good long Stu Corsar is uh, a good bloke, very good bloke. Well, hopefully we'll get him to the club uh, at some point as well in the near future. He does tend to come down this way fairly often, so um, hopefully he'll pop in, in next year when we're playing games again and, and come down for the afternoon and we'll have a few drinks and that. And yeah, he's he's he's, he's a barrel of laughs, to be fair. Not to yeah. play against by the sound of it, but he's a barrel of laughs. Yeah, he sounds like if you played against him, you might come up worse. Um, but if you want to drink with him, he sounds like he'd, he'd be a good laugh for that. So that's good. Especially, um, especially the old uh, espresso martini. Well, yes, the espresso martini is something we're going to have to have on the menu now. Uh, <laughs> because it is now going to be the new Guinness of rugby. Um, <laughs> shall we get into it? Because it is a long podcast. She's um, long and yet. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else to talk about because there's still no rugby. Still no rugby, still no update on rugby, and now they're starting to cancel things, which is worrying. Yeah, there's even less real rugby to watch because they've cancelled Europe. So this two weeks is rugby less. Um, to be fair, apart... I think I think we cancelled Europe first, didn't we? Well, yeah. Uh, are you suggesting Brexit is the reason coronavirus is it? Uh, anyway, let's move on. Conspiracy <laughs> theories, conspiracy theories. Right, let's do, talk to Stu. <laughs> so here we are with Stu. Stu, how are you doing? Uh, not too bad, thanks. Just uh, trying to keep warm in sunny Aberdeenshire. <laughs> How cold is it? Uh, it is cold. It's uh, we just got rid of the snow. We have just got ice now, but it's the wind. Um, and plus, I don't wear trousers unless it's for like a court or a funeral or a date. You know, I just always wear shorts. So it's like you know, everyone gives you the comments like, "Where the hell are you out in shorts?" But no, it's uh, yeah, it's a bit Baltic to be fair. My own fault. I ran into one of our lads in Tesco a minute ago and I was getting some beer and uh, I was in shorts and you gave me a look of, you just, you're just a dick, which I am, <laughs> but, but there we go. Um, so for, for those who don't know you, you uh, obviously, you Castle, you played for Glasgow Warriors, Brother and Titans, uh, Doncaster Knights, and you're also in the unders for Scotland, if I'm right, and you played Scotland A. Yeah. Right. But do you want to just let people know, uh, when you got into rugby and kind of who your idol, idol was uh, when you started playing? Yeah, so uh, probably when I was like, when I was really young, I tried every sport. Uh, I was quite, you know, lucky that my folks would just let me give any, anything a shot, really. Uh, my primary school was really good. I mean, they always tried to make us uh, play a bit of everything as well. And our head teacher was always getting like PE specialists in to do stuff. Uh, football was obviously the main sport, but I was absolutely rubbish. I loved defending, loved kicking people, uh, you know, like I loved that kind of thing. But I just had two left feet. Um, and then we did touch rugby, really enjoyed that. So I must have been about 11 years old. Uh, and then I went to join my local club with about a group of us that had been playing the touch rugby at the school. Uh, so I joined Giri, which was my local club, which is in Inveruri. And uh, I mean, it was a ragtag bunch of kids, basically, that sort of went along there. And uh, so luckily enough, played there for you know, about eight years, I think, on and off. Uh, went through, played like Scotland under 16s all the way up to under 21s. Um, and then obviously just progression. I went and played for Aberdeen Grammar at the time, who was the, uh, the, the local club in the area who were in the, the top amateur league. And... Um, 
and then you know lucky enough to to get an apprentice contract with Glasgow was there for a few years you know ups and downs good learning curve looking back at it now um went to Rotherham really enjoyed it probably the best you know the happiest I was as a rugby player was there uh, went to Donny again something different um you know good learning sort of from that and then uh, came back to Aberdeen with family and then unfortunately had to end it all with uh, too many head knocks so that was a bit of an issue <laughs> but uh, and then also was lucky enough to go and play Scotland A's as well so I went on a few tours with them and also get a few few runs against the full team and and bits and bobs so yeah you know I was very lucky as a rugby player I've had you know some good trips um, good experiences and you know and I was lucky to do something that I loved for you know seven eight years so yeah no good just coming from a you know picking up a rugby ball at a, a primary school that my, my head teacher was passionate about you know giving everyone a chance to play the you know things that they wanted to try that's cool that's cool I mean before we uh, ask you to describe your playing style I know that you reached out on Facebook to uh, to some of your pals but Phil you've got some mutual friends um, and you reached out for some feedback as such, like a school report, but maybe a little worse. Um, do you want to go through what you got back, Bill? Yeah. So, I mean, from um, a fellow Scot who you played with at Doncaster, I'll let you try and work out who it is, who also you played with under 21s as well. So that probably gives it away. <laughs> there, was a, um, there was a few of us actually. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, there was a few Donny boys uh, and Rotherham guys that played Scotland 20s together. Uh, so there's two there's two names that stick out, but I'll hunt either one down, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny you should say that, because um, <laughs> um, one of the stories he's got about you is um, apparently your missus dropped you off at the gate for training one morning, uh. Uh, which was a, a common occurrence by the sounds of it. And you and uh, the other player walked up towards Castle Park down the drive, um, and you were slightly uh, anguished about the current selections and frustrations about not being in the team that weekend or not starting that weekend. I think was clarified. Uh, and just as you got to the door, the main entrance, um, realised that you hadn't taken your boots out of the car. <laughs> and one of the things you were complaining about the coaches didn't trust you and thought you were disorganised <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, hey, hey, I'd turn out and play you know, put them on a pitch you know, didn't have to wear anything <laughs> I'll give you another one that was bad uh, and Donnie as well to be fair no wonder I did I must have been the head knocks I played the head knocks um, uh, I was on the bench again surprise and uh, they were like oh on you get <clears throat> took off my warm up top like, you know, shell top thing. Fuck, I left my bloody uh, rugby jumper in the bloody change room, hadn't I? I said, fucking bolt all the way back into the changing room, stick it on, run back out again. But, oh, yeah, no. For those, for those who don't know, at Doncaster, the sub benches are obviously in front of the stand on the yeah. side of the pitch. And the change room's right down the end of the pitch. <laughs> yeah. And as a prop, that was a scary experience on the run 30, 40 yards to go and get your shirt. Tonight, so. I, did that. I did that myself when playing for Nottingham at Middle Lane. But luckily, it's not as bad there because you can just dive in the tunnel so you know yeah, yeah. see you're sprinting down the touchline. Phil, you also uh, had uh, another comment come in, didn't you? From a friend yes, and uh, um, a, a chat we've mentioned already while we've been speaking beforehand, uh, Kendo. He he couldn't think of enough stories. He, he just exploded in a message to me. Um, but my favourite part of said message... And I'll read it verbatim, so not to ruin Kendo's <laughs> lovely <laughs> linguistic skills. For those who don't know, Kendo's from New Zealand, and his English is about as good as someone from New Zealand. <laughs> Better than Stu, that, Scott. Here we go. <laughs> Stu fucking Corsar. <laughs> 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 really nice lad off the pitch, but such a nasty fucker on it, including <laughs> training. His better playing days were at Rotherham. Didn't see his full potential at Knights due to injuries and his hatred <laughs> of Brett Davy and Lynn Howes, <laughs> who were the two coaches that he served under, I believe. 
<laughs> I think that's uh, Kendall probably put his own words into that. <laughs> his own <laughs> hatred in there. He's just trying to stitch me up. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, to be fair, like um, he hit me on the head, like loved Rotherham. Um, it, it just because it was different. I think because I wasn't involved in rugby 24 7 there. You know, I, I still I worked as part of the the, the charity the Titans Foundation. So, I mean, I was doing that during the day, you know, I, I was training. I was, you know, I was doing something all the time there. And when you went, I went to Donny because um, it, everyone was like, oh, more money and all that. But it wasn't, I actually paid less to go to Donny. And, um, but the thing, main thing was because I had the Scotland scrum coach, a boy called Massimo at the time. So I was like, you know, this was, I was hoping to try and get back, back to Scotland, you know, back home and, you know, try and learn more, um, you know, from a, a good coach. And then but I went to, to Donnie, yeah, and it was just, I didn't enjoy it. I just didn't enjoy being there. I didn't enjoy the uh, the culture. I just, I, I felt negative. I turned really negative when I went there. Um, I was frustrated that I wasn't playing. You know, everyone put so much effort into training, but then it was just crap when we played. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I'll put my hands up. You know, I I made loads of mistakes, and I wasn't switched on probably for a good bit. I was I was there. You know, um, I should have left. To be perfectly honest, probably sooner than what I did. Um, but I kind of felt like I love of rugby. Um, perfectly honest, um, and that's why I took a step back and, and decided to to go home. And my son was that troublemaker that just keeps running in. You know, he was just way to get bored. So that was like eight years. Um, so I, I took a decision. I got a chance to go back home and, and work for my, my old rugby club and do a bit of playing. I thought if I get back into Scotland and then, you know, see where things take me and hopefully move to a sunnier climate after a couple of years. But unfortunately, things did not work out like that. And I'm still <laughs> still in Aberdeen, so I'm still up this way. Um, you know, Brett and, and Lynn, <laughs> I have a lot of time for Lynn, actually. Um, you, you know, I, I've a funny story, like I think we were playing in Scotland once and uh, and I'd went out to catch up a few guys that I knew in Scotland and obviously came back in a little bit too late before the night before the game and uh, he was sat in the bar. So I mean he sat down and you know had a beer with him and had a good bit of crack and you know he's interesting stories, he was a good lad and you know we never I think yeah we were both frustrated with each other probably and um, we probably more realistic idea didn't hate him I mean you know always learned something off him he just fucking hated Nottingham <laughs> he absolutely hated Nottingham uh, with a passion and I did love that I did love some of the stuff about him um, and probably he didn't bring the best out of me and I probably didn't give him my best either uh, Brett uh, I think he was just out his, out his depth maybe um, you know he had some good ideas but I think personally for me I was at that point where I just couldn't be arsed, you know. I just wanted to play 80 minutes of rugby and go out and, and, and enjoy myself and, and win. That's what I wanted to go and do. Um, and I just felt frustrated. So, you know, for me, I should have, looking back on it, should have just sort of made a jump and, and moved on to something else. But um, I didn't do that in time, unfortunately. So what year did you leave, Donny? Did you leave the year before they got relegated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, I left and then I got relegated. So that's why. So if they'd kept me, and uh, yeah, if they kept me, kept us all the old boys, and uh, I think a few of us that year actually left. Um, yeah. There was a bit. There was a big out. fall off that year. Big fall off yeah. that year in quality at Doncaster. Yeah, I um, mean, it was... I joined when we were in when Donny were in that one. So I joined oh, yeah. Donny in that one. We got promoted. And then did a year in the championship with them before. Like you, it's quite funny the way you were talking about it. You just lost all sort of motivation for it and needed to find somewhere else. I decided to leave because I just couldn't, I just totally lost the interest in playing there. And I didn't have a great relationship with the coach. Mm. Um, and just felt, you know, it's time for time to go and do something else. So I did two years there, you know, got loads of mates there, made loads of mates there, but just a bit disillusioned with the with the whole process towards the end of it and, and decided to do something different. So I did have a quick scan through of uh, comments that were on your social media post about how your style of play it and stuff. There were some interesting ones. Um, 
how would you describe your style of play compared to how other people have described your style of play? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the same. Like, um, yeah, quite abrasive. I think somebody put that. And I was just like, yeah, I, I loved contact. Um, so when I was, like, when I was younger, I was really fit. Um, like, used to do a lot of running. I bought my mate, best mate, didn't like rugby, but he was a, a boxer, did a lot of wrestling, MMA stuff. I mean, we used to train together all the time and we used to love knocking seven bells out of each other. And I just love that physical side of it. Um, and I've never backed down, you know, from anything. I'd always take things on head on. And I kind of just did that with rugby as well. Um, so, yeah, I love the contact. I would hit above my, my weight. I mean, when I was my first pro contract as a prop I was 94 kilos and I remember to the first, yeah turned up to my first session and the boys were just taking the piss out of me because I was such a lightweight um and I'm it was like I'm like yeah but I might be light but I'll, in my attitude was I'll knock you out you know what I mean you run at me I'll put you back on your arse that was and you know I, I could hold my own um and a few folk would have, have said that and, and would say that um but I, like the running joke was, so I was no running. That was probably the first problem for me was, you know, I used to get run, run around the pitch, run, hit things. I used to play back row, so I was always in over the ball. Um, and because I had no regard for my body, I didn't mind getting punched, kicked and booted. And, and obviously I played for my local team as well when I was like 16, 17, like senior rugby. And that's what it was. It was just like a bunch of old men battering hell of each other. And because I was the youngest and I was in a ruck, I just get cheap shot at galore. <laughs> you know, it was just like, and that's how I learned how to play. It was just, I was 16. I think my first game was up at RAF base. Uh, I got play. I was playing back row. I got pinned down and eye gouged, and I just flipped. I just turned the boy. I just started leveling, you know, seven shades out of him, and I got dragged off by one of my own players. And I wasn't proud of it, but I was just because it was near my eyes. I just flipped me, and then uh, my dad took me off and gave me the massive bollocking. You know, and that, that was, you know, I felt so embarrassed. But then I was just like, as soon as I went back on the pitch, I was just like, first chance I got to run at the guy that did it. I was just like, right, I'm, you know, I'm having it. So that was kind of like my mindset with it. I was, you know, if somebody bigger ran at me, I was always determined to put them on their arse. Um, and yeah, so a few, few bruises, few stitches, a few broken teeth and broken bits and bobs. But um, yeah, I just, I didn't like losing. I uh, always wanted to win, um, and I've just thrown, I had no regard for my body. I just throw it into everything and anything. So, um, and as a rugby player, I knew that was the risks. You know, if I broke something, fair enough. You know, um, but hey, I just wanted to win. That was probably <laughs> the mentality of it. So, one of my uh, one of my favourite comments was Joe Marler wannabe. How do you <laughs> hey, uh, how do you respond to that? <laughs> that was 10 years ago that was I must have been about 10 I think we played Exeter so they were in the the championship so I think that was 2008 the year they were 2009 when they got yeah it? it must have been around about then so yeah Joe Marler's copying me so I'll, <laughs> I'll have that back we'll, uh, we'll at him on social media to see if he has a response <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. that sounds good <laughs> Um, so, like you said, you 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 enjoy your rugby and stuff. Um, always wanted to win. But one question I do have written down, and I did prompt you with it, was about rugby tours. Um, now, we always like to get rugby tours early in on the podcast, just in case there's some stories we want to dwell on, and we can drop some of the other shit questions we've got lined up. So have you got any standout rugby tours uh, which really stick out when you, when you think about your, your time off the pitch? Yeah, there's a lot of tours. I was lucky to go to loads of different places and uh, see a lot of things, and you know, witness a lot of different cultures. You know, so yeah, it was it was good. Saw some great sights. Um, but yeah, there was a few. I remember being away with one of the A tours. We ended up in uh, Canada, and there's a case. Oh, well, yeah, we basically dropped off our bags, and a couple of boys, senior boys, a bit more respectable, were you know straight off on the skate. You know, when you've got like a training session planned that afternoon, basically, but because they'd been there before, they were like, right, we know the great pubs. And because I was the youngest and used to love socialising, you know, I'd be dragged along on these on these nights out. But, but yeah, it's, you know, I was 
you know, done there, had a had a good laugh, and I don't know. You're probably better asking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how far I could go because I could get myself into a lot of trouble or some other guys into a lot of trouble. So uh, <laughs> there was, uh, it was good. It was good. Um, Romania, I went to, I was lucky enough as well to go to Romania. Um, and again, that was an interesting place. I think I wasn't in the, the final team. So we, we were in the final, I think we were playing the French Barbarians. And uh, so four of us weren't in the squad. So we thought we'd do some recon for the guys and sort of see where the best places were to go for clubs and you know up pubs for the next night. And um, yeah, so got absolutely you know slightly drunk on the local vino and then uh, found some awesome nightclubs. Never found them the next night, but then obviously it was a bit drunk and it was a bit peeved off with the coach's decision not for us getting selected. So the four of us started batting the hell out of his uh, his door at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Um, Mr. Robinson uh, banging on his door at two, three o'clock in the morning, shouting why we were not in the team. Uh, and then made a bolt back to our beds, uh, back to our rooms, where we all decided just to pass out. Uh, and then unfortunately the next morning, hung over as hell, uh, when the front nose went down injured and of course I had to bloody boot up and I was still hung over as hell um, trying to hide with the kit man you know, do my jobs but thank Christ uh, the prop managed to get a, a bit of strapping on and thought he'd be able to sit on the bench so I was uh, a bit lucky with that one so uh, yeah and then Ireland is the graveyard I think of every Scottish, man, uh, Scottish person I had a few uh, few trips over there and uh, a certain international player again uh, he sort of didn't get back to his hotel in time and uh, <laughs> next no one could get hold of him no one knew where he was couldn't get hold of him we're on the plane back to Glasgow next thing you know next day he turns up he'd uh, managed to get his way back to the uh, airport and with no money he lost his wallet lost his phone uh, he had to borrow money off the, the supporters to get a flight back to Glasgow and uh, enjoy it. So yeah, and I must say I've done that. I've, uh, I uh, I went out, met a few folk that I knew across in Ireland. So I ditched the guys that I was out with, um, and I went out to skate with them. Went back to a house party, and then next thing you know, it was like six in the morning. Realizing that the the bus had left to the hotel at six fifteen. I'm on the wrong side of the bloody the city. Raced back across, had to wait the taxi driver to wait, went in, rushed, packed my bags, got to the airport, uh, had to pay like an extortionate charge for my rugby kit. I just gave half of my rugby kit away to the people that were there and then uh, jumped on the plane with my rucksack and, <laughs> and managed to get my own way home kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there's been a few funny instances, probably a lot worse. Um, but, yeah, we'll maybe come back to some of that later on. Um, we had some questions come in off social media. Uh, for yourself um the first one was how many espresso martinis can you drink in 17 minutes <laughs> was from, uh, um, mr chisholm i know who this is <laughs> yeah it was mr chisholm <laughs> <laughs> a lot more than what he could i think he ended up going home after a couple um yeah a lot yeah definitely that was a, a rough night um, is it a, a tradition to try and sink as many espresso martinis as possible because you get drunk and off your tits at the same time? Well, yeah, that was the first time I actually drank them. I think that was his idea to go and uh, to try these things. I've never had them before. And I was just like, yeah, I'll drink anything. You know, once I've had a few, it's fair game. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, I'll be great. You know, keeps you up all night and, you know, gets you pissed as well. And, uh, yeah, it was great for me. I was buzzing till about three, four o'clock in the morning. I think he got home and... <laughs> passed out <laughs> so I never saw him again uh, I remember going <laughs> to light. so yeah yeah so yeah I'll have to you catch what, you know what Tom for our next when we get to go out again that might be a great start for me and you just 10 minutes four maybe five hammer him down because I at my age and with children I need that caffeine input to get me through a night <laughs> yeah and as someone who's fat and lazy I might need the same caffeine <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it fairly gets you going. It got the bells moving as well. I must say, I think uh, Mr. Chisholm probably just about, uh, you know, missed the toilet, shall we say? I think. I think he was, uh, he was his stomach didn't take it to him very well. So <laughs> yeah, it was a good, good, good night, good crack, a good company. 
Uh, he's a very good rugby guy, actually. I think he'd be good for you to have on. He's got a lot of knowledge. He did a lot of good things up at Highland uh, Rugby. Uh, and he's obviously now down at Edinburgh Bats. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'll catch up with him and get a few more espresso martinis and hopefully I'll last the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those guys saying. that when I'm drinking, I've got to stay out the whole night. I've got to find out all the dirt on everyone. If I go home early, that's bad news. <laughs> so, the boys yeah. have started realizing if they drink around me and tell me stories, it's not long until I try and get them on the podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before uh, before we move on to the next question, we, when I was at uni on a Wednesday, we I, I didn't play for rugby for the university at all, so I was just kind of just a melted wheelie bin. But uh, we used to we tried to start a Gaelic football society. Uh, just to get tickets to go to Ocean, which is the big student nightclub area where the socials go. And we used to drink uh, two litres of Frosty Jacks and then in the first bar try and sink as many Jaeger pints as possible, which is probably worse for the heart than espresso martinis, but I would be awake in bed until about eight o'clock on my own. Thank you. But <laughs> yeah, shaking, crying in a corner. Um, yeah. the, 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 the other question that came in uh, was from Billabong John. Um, I'm not sure that's how he was christened, but we don't know. Um, <laughs> What he wants to know is, what's your your uh, KD ratio on COD? Um, <laughs> shocking, eight point six, something like that. Uh, but I blame my my youngest son tries to get on and play with it. That's that's the that's the problem. So, um, <laughs> no, no, it's a typical professional rugby player that you have to play computer games. Um, so, because there's so much spare time on your hands, and that's probably why, you know, when I was at Rotherham. You know, you were always busy and doing stuff uh, and being quite constructive with your time. Uh, but then sometimes, obviously, you'd just be like, sit for a few hours, play Halo or Call of Duty with the, with the guys. And um, and because my son, my eldest son's 14, uh, he's in the Call of Duty. So, and he's actually down in Doncaster just now. He's, well, he's my stepson, so he's staying with his dad just now. So, we'll be keeping touch is by playing Call of Duty against each other. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So other ways he won't speak to us. You know, I say I saw his mum uh, earlier on when I was picking up the wee man. I was just like, "Have you heard from Marley?" No, he never speaks to me. I'm like, "Oh, I was speaking the other nights," and but it's the only way you can, you know, communicate with a teenager is by being online playing Xbox. So uh, <laughs> I must say, like, I used to do better than John Boy. John Boy is not a very good Call of Duty player. Oh, so, is he not? Is he not? No, no. To be fair, he wouldn't be able. He'd be rubbish in real life as well. He's like the size of a barrel. <laughs> so, <laughs> I tell you. so um, I'll have to get him out paintballing so I can pick on him. <laughs> <laughs> I am always shocked when uh, I'm not shocked, interested when they talk to pros on other podcasts, won't name them because they're rivals. Um, but they were speaking, uh, I listened to one with Mac over in the polo on today, and he was saying he's by far the best FIFA player in uh, in the England camp. And it's just the people you don't expect, which are the best at uh, best at computer games. But Phil, you, you, I know you're a bit of a you like a bit of a go on a contest. exactly the same reasons. Like we had a we had a Call of Duty team at Nottingham. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was eight of us, and we'd rotate the squad so that we had six online at any one time playing together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. It got a bit. It got a bit silly. We played against like four Worcester Warriors lads once. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It got so pathetic. Yeah, it's, it's really bad. Like, uh, so when I lived in Rotherham, I always related to, like, being in the Big Bang Theory. Like, um, like for, some of the guys were really geeky. And I'm a geek as well. I quite, I've got a geeky side to me. But, like, some of these guys we could strip down computers and do all that kind of stuff. And I remember Halo was a big thing. So there'd be two at our house, two at the other guy's house. We all had our roles when we played Halo. And, you know, you'd destroy other teams and... <laughs> Especially the other guys, they'd be hammering, they'd be shouting abuse. And I'm like, mate, the kid's eight years old and you're calling him an absolute, you know, belly. <laughs> you know, rain it in a wee bit. He's like, yeah, but we just dominated them. We destroyed them. Fucking have that, you little shit. And you're like, hey, calm down. <laughs> that was the usual chat. You know, that's, uh, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, actually. I remember it was like three in the morning. We were playing and it was a massive bang, like absolute unbelievable. Um. And some of the Irish boys came around. One of the boys from Belfast. He said, "Boys, boys, that was a fucking explosion. That was a bomb." So I can't remember that, but it was an earthquake, apparently. 
I did, yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> we were like, oh, fuck, there's a bang, yeah. All right, come on, guys, we get back to the game. We were just so focused on <laughs> everyone. We were playing some, like, tournament where we are doing unbelievable, and everyone was just like, my God, there's been an explosion. Something's gone off. Nah, boys, come on, let's get on with Halo. That's more important. <laughs> <laughs> there was an explosion these are more important yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> kill these that's more important <laughs> <laughs> so uh thanks for uh the the questions on socials if in is actually as interesting as you make them sound uh we'll have to get him on another chat with him so we can get his feedback on the uh the espresso martinis um, yeah. maybe you two and us two can meet up and have uh, espresso martini off to, yeah, uh, no, see definitely. Win. See you win. I mean, I, uh, fancy my chances here. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, I'd still come down quite a bit, actually. I try and get down. As you say, like Steve Bowden um, yep. and, and Chalner and stuff, like, um, I still try and keep in touch with those guys at Donny. And, uh, I've got a few other guys that I know down there as well. So, are you friends with Quigs? Well, yeah, I know Quigs. <laughs> I mean, I mean that is a bit racist of me because he's Scottish and a prop is the main reason I'm coming with that. <laughs> yeah. He just never seems to stop going. Oh, honestly, he's a bloody fat waste of space. But I tell you what, <laughs> like he's fucking done well for himself. Um, his like I, I've known Quigs. I like Quigs. He annoys me as well. Uh, but I tell you what, he, he's done well. You know, he's he's always plodding along. I think he's at Rotherham now, isn't he? I think he's back um, at Rod, yeah. Yeah, and you know, he'll be loved there. He's a good character and um yeah, fucking hates a fitness test, hates a salad, but he's a typical, you know, prop. I mean, he yeah. he's he's literally the worst athlete <laughs> yeah. I ever played with, I think. Yeah. Oh. I can't oh, remember yeah. anyone else who was more offensive as a human being. There is uh, I can think of one other player. Oh, actually, I actually won't say his name, but I remember going to Rotherham. And some of the Rotherham guys, when he watches, I know who it was, but I remember like he was a second rower trying to pick him up. And you know, like most guys are got a bit of muscle definition, but like when you squeezed his legs, you know, to try and lift him, your hands just squeezed in like he was just like a marshmallow, it was fucking <laughs> disgusting. And he was actually an international player as well, but maybe not a big international team, maybe one of the C teams, like right down the leagues. So Rotherham player, internationalist. I had fucking legs like a sponge. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to have a look. I'm gonna have to look back at that later. And see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was a, an experience as well. Trying to lift him up, and he just he, again, he was like a melted wheelie bit. Just you know, fucking jelly baby. Just disgusting to even. <laughs> One thing that uh, you're doing about to seriously stuff, I guess. Um, big rig rugby. Uh, what is big rig rugby? How how did it come about? Um, so when I when I first came back to, to to Scotland, I was in Aberdeen Grammar as a development officer for them, and uh, so I was working in schools and stuff as well, and, and working with the youth and the, the primary school stuff and all that. And then um, so like the fund funding got cut for that. I went back to join my my original club, Giri, and I was a development officer there, and that was like maybe a two year job. But um, again, Scottish rugby. You know, just different situation again. Money got cut from that, and uh, again went through that stage of like, is, you know, is this for me? Do I really want to do it? So I stopped, stopped playing rugby for a bit, and you know, just did jobs here and there, doing different stuff. And then I was like, well, why not just set up my own my own company and rather than uh, clubs up here because we don't have the finance to to sort of have you know to pay a development officer. Uh, would be just to be offering my, my services that you know. You know, you've got X amount of budgets, right? What does that buy you? X amount of hours I can go in and, and deliver to schools. Um, so I can go in and deliver a six-week program. We'll deliver to schools and then we'll have, um, you know, like festivals and stuff, promote the club and, you know, hopefully you'll get some players. If not, it's just a positive influence that you're doing some work in the community, trying to get the kids fit and healthy and stuff. And, you know, and it was good for sponsors and, and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, I was also working as a coach educator, so I was delivering level one, level two coach ed stuff. So it kind of fitted in with that. And then I was sort of working with the, like our player development group. So again, talented players trying to get into like the local district stuff. So you've got your county stuff, we've got districts. Mm. Um, so yeah, it kind of just fitted in with that. And then, so I was 2017, I think I started it, but then 
because I've been doing other bits of work, I've never really actually just sat down and just gone, right, let's just get on with this. Um, and then I think sort of more in the last sort of year or two, uh, I've gone back into coaching women's rugby. That sort of got me the buzz back to, you know, actually coaching a, a team. And then, uh, yeah, just sort of again, pick up different work from different clubs, sort of doing the, the, the school stuff and um, and then started doing one on one stuff. So it just sort of kind of keeps evolving a little bit. Um, you know, like one on one skill stuff, like there was a lot of kids here that, you know, I, I, I love coaching. That's my passion of when I left school. Uh, I went, so I left school at 17, went to college, and then I actually ended up working at the school that I just left. So instead of me being in six years, I was actually coaching rugby, um, and then I was coaching in the community. So um, so I've done it for over 20 years, on and off. Um, like I was co- I coached Wheatley Hills as well, yeah. and Donny, so be, being there, did a bit of work with them. Uh, it was Scully, Dave Scully, I don't know if he's still going about. Uh, Strum half. Uh, rather than boy but yeah so and so i just kind of and then the main thing was like a lot of people started talking about concussion and then it was just trying to get people to scrum light because i was really worried about uh, player safety and you know i love the coach ed stuff but i think coaches weren't getting enough support so i started doing a little bit more of that like trying to support coaches and helping them so i was doing like um like forward sessions where i'm just really stripped down how players would like engage in a contact here, like just simple body shape, neck exercises, you know, just hitting a contact the right way. Mm. And it's quite funny because the way I play to the way I coach is completely different. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if I if I was uh, attacking as a player, I'd be like, you know, I did sidestep once or twice, but, you know, I'd always run that hard fucking line I just loved running a hard line I used to love a standoff that would take the ball to the line and just hit me flat so like Mike Whitehead for Rotherham uh, Titans you know uh, he was called the general but I used to love playing with him because you know he could hit you flat hit you in a space and you know that was my favourite kind of player to run off it's funny you called him the general we called him the revolving door defensively <laughs> So we call them that as well. Eh? I tell you what, honestly, right? So I remember playing on the worst, I can't even remember where it was, like Launston or something. Like absolutely dump of a pitch, muddy brown. You know, everyone comes off blacker than black. And there's him, white as the ace of spades. But I tell you what, <laughs> and to be fair, this is one thing I always remember when uh, when I coached defence. I was just like, so I always bring him up. Because I was like, this guy could not tackle worth a shit. I says, like, you know, you'd be better just put a pole there. You know, you'd do a better job. But to tell you what, he would communicate. He could talk. You know, he'd be like, Corsair, get there, mark him, he's your man. He would boss everyone around him so he didn't have to tackle. And that was the reason why he talked so much. Because I'm not fucking tackling. You guys can tackle. And, you know, his columns were really good at that kind of thing. So, yeah, definitely the general would organise, but, yeah, he couldn't tackle worth a shit. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, it's... So, I mean, it keeps evolving, uh, Big Rig Rugby. Uh, obviously, now, because I can't get into schools and stuff, I was maybe working in some of the local prisons. I got asked to go and do some stuff in there, um, you know, try to work with some of the, uh, you know, the inmates and stuff. And, actually, the guy was from Plymouth and played a lot of bit of rugby in Plymouth. He was an inmate, and it was him that instigated it. So, But because of the COVID, I never got to, to actually meet him, unfortunately. Um, and then, um, so, just started doing online stuff and then just do some videos and then started doing, like, little chats on a Monday night with people. Um, so, yeah, it's just sort of just, just evolving and probably just getting back to... Uh, I love a rugby, but to be fair, I love I love coaching. I love sharing uh, my experiences, uh, and I love hearing how other guys coach and, and teach as well. And so, where I live in uh, Scotland, so you've got Glasgow and Edinburgh on the borders. That is your rugby hotbed for Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, up Aberdeen way, it's all football, and we we don't play a high enough standard. We don't play enough well, so. You know, the, the step that I always wanted to do was, was take a group of kids or a group of players was to go and, and travel and tour because I think um, if I could cherry pick some of the better players, you know, let's let's go and tour down to Doncaster. I think it was a big tournament in Doncaster. Um, they do in April. I was like, right, we'll, we'll do that. Unfortunately, COVID came up and 
and stuff. So for me, it's just about giving the kids more experience, mm -hmm. uh, sharing my ideas and, and just sort of making sure that the coaches are, are doing things safely uh, and, and just helping them out. Because as you say, we're, we're a bit isolated away from Murrayfield. Like Scottish rugby is really good with the coach education, but you know, unfortunately, we're a wee bit out in the, the wilderness when it comes to rugby um, up here. So I just trying to sp spread the love, <laughs> you know, help them out as much as I can. So uh, that's quite in interesting. You mentioned the the tournament, uh, the age group tournament at Donny, because Paviors do most of the Doncaster tournaments. Really? Yeah. So uh, especially our younger age groups, they hold uh, like a under fives to under tens tournament earlier on in the year and my nephew played that every year you know on his way through um and they do play some age groups i believe jonty who's been on here before as a scrum half mm. he coaches his brother's age group which is now under 16 probably something like that yeah, yeah. and nice. they played there last year in a tournament yeah. uh, it looks really off. good well sir. and i think for doncaster has got a really great facilities mm. um and I was just like, you know, I thought, right, it'll be great for, for our players to go down there because I mean, we're used to playing in fields where the cows have had a shite, you know, in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, you're just like, right, let's go and, and, and actually play at a decent ground and get some, you know, decent environment and try and help some of the guys to come and, you know, and see them and stuff and, you know, make it a good environment for them and just a different style of rugby and a different experience because touring, you learn so much through touring. Yeah. You know, you, you meet so many different people and... Mm. It, it, that's what rugby is about. It, I mean, I'm go, same as you guys. You'll have friends all around the world that you know. You'll, as you say, even about Hamo, you probably haven't spoke to him in years, but you know, if you turned up in Hong Kong, give him a call. You know, he, he'd look after you. Yeah, um, and that's what rugby is about. And um, as I say to the guys, you might not never make a professional rugby player, but you know, it'll help you travel. It'll make you a better person. You will, you know, get so much out of it if you if you put that goodness in. So. Um, yeah, just trying to expose the, the guys to that. And funny enough, I just saw Brighton Sevens have tried to launch the date for 2021. So I've got a girls team, hopefully, so signed up to go to go down there. So we're hopefully taking my, a women's rugby team down to Brighton. So oh, awesome. that should be, that's, I'm hoping that COVID will fuck off and we can <laughs> uh, <laughs> and actually play some rugby. So uh, that's my, my goal. Again, for the for myself, it's a it's a target, you know. And, and for the girls that you know, some of them have had a tough time with, with COVID for various reasons. I think it's just you know we've got to have a target. And so mm. if we get there, we get there. If not, I'm sure we can mm. organise something else to to keep us entertained. But hopefully, we'll get some rugby. Yeah, no, Brighton's a a good old place to go. Maybe we uh, I might pop down and say hello, and then. Go for a few beers. Um, <laughs> Always keen for a few beers. <laughs> Before we uh, touch on our last topic, uh, you might have seen if you skip through other stuff before, Phil likes to get his package out at some point in a podcast. Um, so, Phil, would you like to introduce your package to our such good friend here, Stu? Um, so it's a it's a quick answer round. So just give us an answer. The first answer that comes to your head, Stuart. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. what's your favourite beverage? Uh, rum. Where are the worst changing rooms you've ever used? Oh, uh, Mosley. Oh, interesting. Because when you played at Rotherham, um, <laughs> hey, our changing rooms were good. It was just the supporters. <laughs> Actually, quick story, Louis McGowan. You must know Louis McGowan. Yeah, I know Louis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the way change rooms, tiny as hell, had to leave all your kit on the outside. The amount of times Louis would kick everyone's the other team's kit down, down the, the back of that hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and we did end up with some nice stash from a certain premiership rugby club as well one year that accidentally <laughs> fell into our changing room. So <laughs> But that's another story. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, so that yeah, I could tell you many stories about the hatred of those change rooms. Um, <laughs> Rotherham or Doncaster? Rotherham. 
most horrible front rower you have played with? Oh, played with. Um, oh, a few. I'll, I'll go with uh, my two hookers. I'll say both from Donny, one from Rotherham, Steve Bowden and uh, Nigel Conroy. Steve Bowden was a horrible human being. <laughs> he's, just, <laughs> he's just a typical Yorkshireman. <laughs> um, <laughs> just <dirty. laughs> he's never bought around that boy. <laughs> oh, he's got really deep pockets, has he? <laughs> oh, very short hands. <laughs> short arms. <laughs> Um, Chal or Kendo? Oh, uh, oh depends. Kendo in a night out, Chal in a scrap. <laughs> <laughs> Best player you played against? Uh, Carl Spencer. Oh, yeah, when oh. North Hampshire in the league. Yeah, uh, when, they were not, uh, when they came down that year. And uh, again, as an idol that I used to watch when I was little, so that was always a good experience. Yeah, I was, I was too young when they were in the league. I was yeah. 16, I think, but um, water boy. Are you really so that really... young? I'm only 31. Are you? He looks yeah. older, I, thought you just, like, I thought you were older than me. No, I've just got a face like it, mate. Right? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I just remember water boy, and Charles, Carlos Spencer was one of my absolute heroes as well. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. Um, Favourite opposition? Uh, oh, I don't know. Favourite opposition? That's a tough one. Um, well, yeah, if probably like Doncaster Rotherham, so it's the local derby games because obviously the fans got really behind it and it was always uh, getting all the old boys coming into the change room, calling another team a bunch of arses was, you know, it was, it was a great atmosphere, you know what I mean? So when I was at Rotherham, it was against Donny, but it was Donny, it was against Rotherham, like, yeah. so. It's a good rivalry, though. Yeah, that, oh, it? definitely. Yeah. It was a very good one, yeah. And then John to your gym. Uh, who the hell calls your son Jonty? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that about? Is that his you real name? I will protect Jonty's father, David. I don't yeah. think David called him Jonty. I think Jonty calls himself Jonty. That's even worse. It's a bit of a no. bell end of a name. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll go for Jim. Jim. <laughs> yeah, right answer, to be honest. Right answer. I mean, why would you call yourself Jonty? Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, why would I mean he doesn't have many friends let's be honest um, so what's your best rugby moment Stu? Um, I think like uh, as I say I was lucky at any time that I um, played for Scotland like you know the Scotland youth stuff for the, the Scotland A team I was very lucky you know to get that far uh, you know so that, they were all good experiences um, uh, you know I, 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 I scored against Leinster. That was quite a good moment as well. I quite enjoyed that. Um, and then, I don't know, yeah, it just, I, I have had a lot of good experiences. My time at Rotherham, loved that. You know, I think in general for me, I'm just very grateful that I had the chance to play professional rugby. And, mm. uh, you know, it was a lot of good experiences. A lot of things that I didn't enjoy, but I mean, I've learned from them. Um, it was It's molded me as a person and, you know, and hopefully I can pass on better things to, you know, you know, better information, better sort of knowledge onto others. So, you know, to play professional rugby, I've just got to be very grateful for that. So um, I, I was lucky. I won, to be fair, like I actually, I won an award um, for uh, the Scotland 21 Player of the Year and stuff. Um, I did the same with Rotherham, you know, and I won a few Player of the Year awards and, you know, like that was really good for me. But for me, my biggest thing that I wish I'd done was actually won something as a team. Yeah, I never, we never won a league, we never won a cup, we never won a, a real trophy or anything. So, you know, that would be my thing that I would like to have done. I'd have loved to have won something as a team. Uh, but, you know, as a positive point, you know, I've, I've played professional rugby, I've, I've done pretty well out of it. I uh, had lots of, you know, I've travelled a lot, lots of good friends out of it. And, well, some good friends, some are just arseholes. <laughs> you know, they, they love to, they love to clip on you and uh, tell stories about you. But yeah, you know. So I think I can't really pick anything out. Um, it just, as I say, lucky to have, have been where I've been and, and done what I've done. Amazing. On the other hand, then, <clears throat> what's your worst rugby memory? <laughs> uh, no, in Kendo. <laughs> Worst rugby moment, uh, being forced to retire, um, you know, getting the concussions. So, 
in my mind, my 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 plan was to to go back to Aberdeen, you know, have my family up in Aberdeen. You know, my mum and dad were close by, have my youngest for three, four years, and then, you know, you know, move down further south or, or, or move abroad to, to play rugby and, and experience that, play rugby abroad. Um, and then having to go into a doctor's office and tell them that you can never play rugby again, you know, that was probably the, the hardest thing ever. Um, because it's something that since I was like, you know, 11 years old, I was like, hell, I actually enjoy this sport and I'm not bad at it, you know. Um, and just be told that's it, you can't play again. So I think I must have been about 30, 31 when that happened eight years ago. Yeah, it would have been about 30. So that was probably the toughest. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something we'll move on to now, I suppose, is, is that was kind of what we wanted to discuss with you mm-hmm. further is, is your sort of experience of that you know the, the build-up of the concussions and and what um what inevitably led to your your retirement mm. so uh well i mean as you said from the like the earlier conversation the comments that like, was always a, a brace of love contact you know i love just i just throw my body into places where it shouldn't be and um you know no regard for my body and uh when I went back to play for Aberdeen, because obviously I was an ex-professional player, you felt like you had to, you know, to prove a point. And, you know, and also I was getting paid to be there. I was getting paid as an employee uh, to deliver rugby in the area. So I always felt like I had to be on the pitch. And for me, like, if I was injured, I'm, I've played with broken, I'd say probably you guys, you've played with broken bits and bobs and torn things. And, you know, you never play rugby 100% fit. And um, so concussion, I got, I can't even remember my first concussion now, but it, it was one of those things that are from, obviously we've talked about over the last couple of months and, and years with a few, uh, a few, my doctor, very like I still keep in touch with her and a few of the guys and that. Um, so I got concussed and I lied about it basically. You know, I was just like, you know, it's only a head knock. Um, and I went back and played like the next week. And so I did that a few times. And obviously, when you get one concussion, it, it's very easy to pick up another one. And you know, it was coming to the point where like I was like physically sick, you know, like a bit of running, I was sick, uh, I couldn't you know, focus on, if it was really bright at day, you know, during the day, um, I couldn't focus on that, like trying to read or look at computers or driving for any amount of time, I was getting splitting headaches, um, this just felt like standing up and falling over, you know, it was all that kind of stuff, and, you know, eventually the, the doctor went and got me, you know, some tests and stuff, but, you know, concussion is a hard thing to actually find, mm-hmm. you know, so I went and got tests, and, you know, the doctors were like, yeah, we're not really too sure, you know, we think you've got a concussion. Well, you do have concussion because you've got the symptoms of it. Um, you know, just rest. But I couldn't do that. I was never used to sort of really sitting about too much. Um, and, you know, I was my biggest, you know, enemy. I, I'd just be like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, I'll, I'll easily play. I'll easily train. So that probably happened for about a year or two. And then um, I had a, a bad incident where I was, I got hit in a game. It was against Edinburgh Ackies, I'm pretty sure. So I got a head knock and I went back on the pitch again, got another head knock. And uh, I was pretty ill, like uh, really bad. And like it was sick, dizziness, like, you know, having to travel on a bus going back up to Aberdeen wasn't it the best of things. Um, and so I basically got told that was my season over and done with. Right, fair enough. I'll, uh, I'll take that. And then... But it was about January time then, so there would only been a handful of games. Uh, so summer, no rugby, no contact, no nothing. I sort of, we had two pre-season games. We played Glasgow Warriors as a pre-season game, and then we played Kirkcaldy, which is like down near Edinburgh. Now, obviously, Glasgow Warriors being the pro team, you know, that was going to be the physical game. So I thought, you know, if I can get through that, I'm good. So uh, typical you know, style of me, I knew some of the Glasgow guys and there was a few scraps, a few fights here and there and, you know, got a few, you know, black eye and all that, but it was fine. You know, I got through the game and it was okay. Um, threw myself about, grand, went and played Kirkcaldy the week after, got the smallest of glancing blows 
off the side of my head and I can't remember <laughs> golf from after that, you know. Um, I got taken to the change room, sick, dizziness, um, really bad. And then I was, uh, so I went back to hospital again and I was getting some really bad symptoms. Like, um, so my doctor was Louise McCulloch. So she was also on SAS Who Dares Wins and, you know, she works in Aberdeen ARI and, you know, her husband's a rugby referee, was a professional rugby referee. And she was just like, you know, you've got to call it a day. Um, I was like, no. And then James, Scottish doctor, been on the Lions, famous doctor. I just uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So basically he got in touch with the club and was just like, you know, we, we've got to call it a day. Well, I, I, well, but before that, I actually went to the, the neurosurgeon doctor and um, they were like, it was a Greek guy. He could hardly speak any English. Well, uh, you know, he probably spoke better English than I did. And I remember <laughs> he was so jolly. And uh, so I was like, oh, you know, it's it's going to be fine because he's smiling. And he was just sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've had concussions and this is what happens to your head. And he was in depth about it. He was just like, so you could get a bang on the head and you could be fine. You could uh, pass out. You could you know, black. It was just so funny about it. And he was just like, then you could be unconscious and then you can die. <laughs> it was just like so blase <laughs> about it. And I was just like, yeah, we're all good because he was smiling. So I was smiling. And then he was just like, I don't think you should get a bang on the head again. And I'm like, yeah, we're all good. And then I was just sort of like, yeah, I'm fucked. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and I came out of the. <sighs> You know, I came out of there and I was just kind of like, oh, pretty flat. And and then obviously Louise would have probably fed that back. And then the so you got involved and were like, you know, you're not insured, you can't play and that's it, you're done. And uh, yeah, and that took its toll. And I think with, you know, I went through a lot of bad times. Uh, I passed out my, my kitchen floor. Um, I was an arsehole to live with, um, you know, with me to my partner and that like just because it was just so moody um you know i just shout you know i was just like i couldn't cope with noise and you've just got a newborn kid you've got like an eight-year-old kid and you know and you, you couldn't cope with noise or light or too much things going off mm. um and and then also being told you can't do the thing that you've loved for so long and that and you know you just retire and that's it so there was a lot of things that that, that you know, that, that hit me at once and, you know, I was a miserable bastard to be about and um, and I didn't see that, mm. you know, I just thought it was just, you know, just life, you know, just, mm. but um, I can sort of, it's probably taken about seven, eight years to think that, well, you know, I was probably depressed, I was just a miserable, I was a miserable bastard, I put my health at risk, seriously, I had a family that I should have cared about and, mm. You know, and, you know, it, it, does it stem down to me at the end of the day? Yes, it did, because I lied. You know, I wanted to be on that pitch. So, you know, that that's the be all and end all. And I know we talked about through the stuff that you sent me is like, what was my thoughts on the uh, Steve Thompson and that sort of suing mm. rugby? <laughs> and, and I find it tough because I can see where they're coming from. You know, like... So rugby for me, yeah, play physical, breaking bones. You know, my worst case scenario was my neck. If I broke my neck, I, you know, that's the biggest fear of every rugby player is, you know, that happening. Um, but I never thought anything about dementia or, you know, so like after I'd finished playing, I would be in the middle of a conversation and I would just completely forget what the hell I was doing or saying. Um, so I, I took over the head role of the head coach role as well, not long after this. Um, and, you know, I shouldn't have done it because I was, my head was in 101 different places and, you know, I'd be coming out with things and I was making out team sheets and the right, the wrong players were in the wrong places. You know, it was just like fucking stupid things like this. Mm. And, but I never saw it. And that, you know, in that bubble that I was in, I never saw any of this. You know, and um, I just thought it was just, I, every life was normal. You know, I was just, yeah, I can't play rugby, but I can still be involved. And But now, now that I look back at it and the more that people tell me, um, I'm like, oh my God, uh, it's just terrible. 
um, I had to go and do a, a test in this, and I had to go and see a specialist about my head. So they asked you 101 questions and then I had to I, I sit down and do a test with her and I had to stop halfway through it because I was physically sick because my head was pounding so much because I couldn't answer the questions. And it was like fucking simple stuff. And it was like, you know, you know, there's five five words, you've got to say it back now, you got to work out this quiz or quote. Uh, or And I was just like, this is easy. Yeah, this is, I can do this. But then actually doing it, like seeing it and doing it, I just couldn't put the two together. Um, and I was actually meant to go back, but I never did. <laughs> I was just like, you know, I never told anyone at the club. I was just like, yeah, yeah, shit, it's fine. And just, you know, that was it. I put, you know, I was an ostrich. I buried my head in the sand and and gave up. You know, I just, I'm like, that's not going to make me any better. It just makes me worse. So I'm not going to do it. So, um, yeah, I was an arsehole for four years, probably. Uh, probably, well, I've always been an arsehole, but that just made it really <laughs> worse. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I they, and to be fair, like I look back on it now, and I'm just like, what an idiot! <laughs> mm. uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing, though. So, I mean, I, I've had three standout, maybe four standout head knocks, um, two of which were friendly fire um, by my own teammates. Um, one was 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 bad enough that I definitely had some serious concussion, and the other one I um, well I fractured my face and skull in a in a tackle, and and obviously you get a concussion in that situation. But the, the one that really sort of made me realise how serious concussion is 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 one of the friendly fire ones we're down at Pirates. Um, when they're at Camborne on that horrendous raised pitch, yeah, and um, <clears throat> the ball, they they knocked the ball on, and I went to dive on the ball as any good back rower should, mm -hmm. and I fly I fly hacked it, but I'd already caught the ball, and he just fly hacked my head, yeah. square in the square in the temple, and obviously I just went out cold, <clears throat> got up, ran. Uh, so, so because he's kicked me in the head I've lost the ball <laughs> terrible terrible <laughs> they've got the ball back they've gone like to the far width and I've run across to autopilot I guess to stand to what near the ball to receive but I'm standing offside in their attacking line waiting to receive a pass <laughs> yeah and then like um, I don't know if you remember Nick Rouse big second yeah. rower and yeah. him, he's screaming at me like get in the line get in the line <laughs> and I'm just stood there like oh yeah and then run over and then they run a play past me and they score mm -hmm. <clears throat> so get behind the sticks and Nick's screaming at the physio to get me off the pitch because I obviously have no idea what I'm doing mm -hmm. <clears throat> and sitting on the sideline and um, Fauci was running the sideline that day for some reason and sat on the sideline and he goes you all right I said oh my neck's my neck's really sore and I'm kind of real spacey and I don't remember it too well and the next thing I know, I'm in I'm in Truro Hospital on a spinal board lying there and I was groggy and horrible but they did all the tests and I ended up going you know I missed the bus home but ended up getting a lift back with someone else yeah. um, but that was in the middle of me writing my dissertation for university yeah and we were in a, it was that winter where, it was the same winter where we played Rotherham, actually, at Rotherham on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> I don't know whether you were at Rotherham for that. I can't, I see, I don't think, I, I wasn't there, I don't think it was a Tuesday that we played, but I remember playing, like, uh, remember British and Irish Cup games, I remember you had to play that compact eight mm. weeks of you played, like, Monday, well, it might have been, because you played the Monday or the Tuesday, but he also played on the Saturday as well, yeah. the Friday or the Saturday. It was a brutal... Yeah, we, um, play, we played at Rotherham on a Tuesday afternoon in yeah. front of, like, three people. <laughs> <laughs> it was genuinely... It was it wasn't more for Rotherham, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that sort of packed. So, so I was set up at home anyway, because yeah. I was at Durham Uni. I was set up at home, and I sat in my mum and dad's uh, living room doing my dissertation, and then about... After about a few days, I realised I was quite concussed. So I headed up back to uni and spent a few weeks up there. But I remember going back to my dissertation after about two weeks and reading through the stuff that I'd written 
in mm. that sort of few days window as at home and it just made no sense like there was no rhyme or reason for what i was writing i was doing a psychology dissertation and i was writing stuff about you know history and science and yeah. it, that was the only time that i really had obvious symptoms of it mm-hmm. um and it is it is a scary thing but my personal point of view on it is is it, it is almost a part of rugby mm-hmm. and always has been but now it's just you know easier to detect is more pronounced in the community and and people are more aware of it what what are your points of view with regards to you know more recent stuff in the in england especially i don't know whether it's the same in scotland is is they're on about taking the tackling out of junior rugby until under 14s or under 15s so um and i think that's stupid because then you're not showing the kids how to tackle Mm. um for me it's like i I spoke to one of the the, so i do like a a monday night chat um i've just started doing it last monday it was a coach educator from scottish rugby and uh, for me, I was just like, I love that we have the so many volunteers, but we need to set higher standards um, because, so I, I'll, I'll go around a lot of rugby clubs and um, you do your level one or you do your level two and you do that once and that's it, um, you know, and there's no follow up. There's no checking to make sure that, I mean, who's accountable for these coaches making sure that the kids are doing it right, you know? We need to sort of make sure that the coaches know how to coach the contact situation. Um, they know how to, you know, to coach a proper tackle. They know how to, you know, put entry into a, a ruck. They know how kids' body shape should be in a scrum, and they should have the, the the guts to say stop. No, you cannot play rugby because you cannot tackle properly. Mm. But we were kind of like. We need as much kids as we can get. Oh yeah, you, you want to play for us? Excellent. You'll play the week after. And off you go on the pitch. The kid hasn't even done one tackle session. So we need to be teaching these kids from five years old where to be aware of their body, and um, whether it be doing like uh, the rugby shape stuff. I mean, um, now concussion. My head is terrible with names, uh, but this guy, the English guy, who did the Tower of Power. Um, You've got yeah, Steve, I can't think who it was. Yeah, Graham something. I've come up with me, I can't remember. You've got uh, Steam Camp, you know, he's on Instagram. He does a lot of the scrum stuff. Uh, Richie Gray, Scottish coach. Um, he does all the, the Rhino products. You know, these guys are all working about technical shape and body shape. And, you know, that this is what we should be trying to make sure that our, you know, our coaches are passing on to the kids. Like, you know, mm-hmm. kids should be aware of their body, where their head should be, the risks which are involved with the tackle. Uh, And they should also have the balls to say, you're not playing because you can't tackle properly. Um, And I don't think we we do that. Uh, I've had to go to a few sessions and I'll I'll walk up to a club and I'll quite happily walk onto the training paddock and go, right, let's have a minute here. Um, You know, kids, right, you know, I always try and make sure that you never, you don't want to embarrass the, the, the coaches, but you're always like, right, kids, you know, good work, go get some water. And then you bring in the coaches and they're like, right, guys, what happened? Where was those kids' heads in the last two tackles? You know, they were in front of the knees, you know, they're in the wrong place. You know, you try and get the conversation out of them and you're like, look, you can, and sometimes they know, they know as well. And you're like, well, bloody tell the kids. Yeah. Tell the bloody kids. If they're doing a tackle wrong, stop them. There's three of you standing there. You... Take the kids that can't tackle out the side and just go over it slowly and surely. And then the kids that are learning at a bit of quicker pace, they can carry on going Halley Rack and battering each other. You know, but if we stop contact, you know, if we don't do contact rugby we're 14, you know, these kids are going to be, you know, a lot more developed and they're not going to know how to use their body. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I didn't I didn't start playing until I was 15. Yeah. But I was lucky enough to be, you know, my brother was already captain of Paviors at that point. My dad had played for Pavias and I'd been up there and watched. So I, I knew the mm. techniques from seeing them. Obviously, yeah. I haven't implemented them myself, but was quite quick at learning that. <clears throat> and I was quite lucky in that form. But you you get some lads that rock up, you know, just to just to start rugby at senior level. Mm. You know, they they could be 21, come out of uni, just come up to a club, never done rugby before. It's very difficult, but it is required to provide them with a a level of tackling coaching 
early on. Um, just because the safety aspects, it's 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 a risky sport. You know, it's it's it is one of the most risky sports out there. But I think taking away the contact from it actually makes it more dangerous because yeah. suddenly you've got a load of fifteen year olds that are, you know, some fifteen year olds are massive. Mm. Yeah, it's scary. And and suddenly one of them's running full tilt, and you've got some skinny lad who just gets his head between the guy's knees or, you know, straight on the shoulder. And that could really affect the kid at that age. Yeah. Mm. And it, I mean, I think that we've got to be smart as coaches. Um, so like I've, I've talked about my, uh, the eldest and he, he's scrawny, he's tiny, um, but he loves the contact. You know, he's, he's, he's always, he, he's done Taekwondo, he's always done contact sports and stuff. And uh, his mate is a good foot and a bit bigger than him, and he's built like a brick. You know what I mean? Like he's a solid. He's a good rugby player, and you know. But if the two of them, if you put the two of them side to side, you know, my one looks about four or five years younger. Um, it's a massive age difference. You know, size difference. You know, and I think what we should be doing is like we need to be putting these kids. You know, put them off a level. You know, we almost should almost be going to the size. And weight ratios. If you look at your, you know, box and taekwondo, judo, you know, in New Zealand, they do that. And I think mm. that if we've got a player who has got the ability and skills and knowledge, and is also physically developed, we should be putting them up in age level. Because well, New Zealand, New Zealand are all size, size yeah. teams. Aren't they? Yeah. You play a, a kilogram, like age group. You don't play an age group. Yeah. You just play a kilogram weight until yeah. you're sixteen, I think, or fifteen. Mm. I think. And then, and then, obviously, at senior schools, you you play age group. Yeah, and so we've, we've got a lad at the minute. It comes to training. He's just hit the academy level for a year a year ago. Tiny. I mean, he's the same size as me and far far wider. And he's mm. been running over kids half his size for probably three years. And he, and he's skillful. His brother actually is captain of Rotherham at the moment. All right. All right. Um, his older brother is captain of Rotherham at the moment, or was. I don't know yeah. if still there this year, but um, yeah, he, he's a fantastic player. He's, he's overweight. He knows he's overweight and he's working on trying to get that down. But he's 15. Yeah. He's the size of our under 19s. <laughs> he's ginormous. But he's good enough as well. It's down to player retention as well. If you, you think about wee Billy Bob, who's two foot nothing, if he's got to try and play against guys like that for three or four years, he's going to knock the stuffing out of him and he's just going to pull the plug. And then you've got the big guy who is just like, well, I'm a big guy. I'll just run straight. So he's not learning any evasive skills. So it's just like, well, you know, the, we're, we're going to lose players and we're not upskilling players. So if we put the bigger player with his own size, he's going to have to learn how to step. He's going to have to learn how to look for space. And but then also we're going to keep wee skinny Jimmy because he wants to stay and play because he's going to be against guys his own age and size. You know, nice one age, sorry, but his, his own size. And he'll gain confidence um, because he's not going to get smashed every time he tries to make a tackle. Um, like I, I mean, I run camps and stuff, and sometimes I, I'm not naughty because I'll speak to the parents, I'll speak to the kids as well, and I'll be like, look, you know, you're too big. Up you get. Um, you know, and, you know, like mo most of the parents and the kids, and I always say to the older ones, right, he's a year, he's a year younger. You know, he's, you know, you be careful. But you know it's rugby; these things happen, and and, uh, and they they get it stuck in, and they hold their own, and they learn, and they enjoy it more. Um, I had a kid who was S one; he jumped in with the S three age group because he was physically and skillfully a lot more developed, and he was running rings around the S threes, you know. <laughs> and that, and he's learning. And his dad came back; and was like he's absolutely loved that. And it was all controlled contact stuff, you know. But like skill wise, he just sort of and confidence for him, he just flourished. And if he went, he came back again for another camp and I, I, I changed the way, the format of it. So he was stuck with his own age group and he was just demoralized because he could run rings around everyone. So I'm like, well, you know, we, you've got to use a bit of common sense. And, you know, I, I've seen the bad sides of it with, with concussion and injuries and stuff. But I think is we've got to use our brains. We've got to be teaching the kids at an earlier age, the, you know, the, the symptoms of concussion. We've got to be showing them how to look after their bodies better. We've got to be showing them the technique from a younger age. 
you know, making them a bit more confident. But then, you know, coaches have got to use their nose and be like, Fuck, you know, he's a big lad. He's skillful. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's put him up an age, you know. We've, we've, got mm-hmm. to, we've got to challenge him because that's how we'll develop that big player into an all-around rugby player, not just a brute that's going to run up, you know, channel one. But then we're also going to retain the, the wee skinny lads that, that fucking don't like contact. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally, it's, totally you know, look, at, look at it from from both sides, like, um, so we'll see. Uh, and you know, like I've had my bad bits, but I've gained a lot out of rugby as well. So I can't be oh, hell no, no, no contact, no nothing. But we've mm. it's educating the coaches. That's that's the big thing. Um, I had a, so when I was at grammar, so I just came through my concussion and well, not through it, but I was still in a bad place with it. I had a player that got concussed in a, 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 the Cali, the district stuff. I, I fed it back to his parents and to his coach that he wasn't allowed to play. Told him as well that he wasn't allowed to play in a, the club cup final or semi-final or something. And his bloody coach played him and he got another head knock. And that was his whole year written off. He uh, So his higher exams, he, he, he couldn't sit because of, he was suffering that bad from concussion. And then, you know, it was just like, well, I bloody told you. I told the player, I told the mom, I told the coach. Who else are you meant to do? Bloody, you know. And, but this was a few years ago. So, I mean, like, um, I don't know if you've seen the, the the signs with if in doubt, sit them out. Yeah. You seen that? yeah. So, again, I feel really bad. I, I'm sure is it Peter? Peter Robinson's the dad. His son, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, is Peter Ben. Apologies, but it's just, um, you know, his son passed away from, from concussion and, you know, he does a lot of good work in promoting it. And um, I'm always trying to retweet and, and send things. that I do rugby shirts as well, and I put that on the side of my shirts because, you know, if there's any sign of concussion, get them off. At the end of the day, it's only a game, you know. Mm. Uh, whereas for me, it was life and death when I played. But now as a coach, I'm like if I see any of my players with a, a slight head knock, I'm like, off you come. I don't care for my best players. I've had the argument on a pitch where one of our you know, our top players got a head knock. She was dozy. Her, her parents had travelled up, took her off the pitch. And then, you know, the girls were like, oh, we need her back on. I'm like, no, you know, it's it's not worth it. She wanted to go back on. The parents wanted her back on. But I'll, I'll be, you know, the, the evil guy and say no, um, because I know what's the... You know the effects in the long run, and it's not worth it. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a really good point, and I think that's a really good point to end on. Is yeah. you know concussion is is no joke, and you know you're a, a almost a model for that. You know you, you probably stopped at the a right time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be some magazine out there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, definitely. But, but... I mean, they... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but thanks for coming on. It's been mint chatting, and you're welcome back whenever you. are Whenever you fancy chatting to two Englishmen. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, no, but honestly, thanks for coming on and thanks for giving us an honest insight to concussion as well because I mean, a lot of people who have played or will probably still play and just lie about it and say, no, and the message is just don't lie about it. It's ridiculous. It's, you've got people to look after and people to love. So if you can't do that, then life's not really worth living in my eyes. But yeah, thanks for coming on. And, yeah, no, my, uh, my pleasure, and uh, and thanks for having us. And as I say, like, hopefully get back on, and, and maybe get you guys on as well. Have a wee chat with us as well. So, um, and and all the best with the podcast, and obviously with the lockdown as well. So, and hopefully get a few beers at some point. Sounds good to me. The last bit <laughs> sounded better than the more content. No. <laughs> <laughs> Espresso martinis all round. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And after that, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> so. That was Stu. That was a good podcast. Like I said, it was long. So if you're still with us, well done. Uh, my hope so, is the content is actually good content. Yeah, which is rare. Mm. Which is rare on these podcasts. So it's definitely worth sticking along. Thanks to Stu. Thanks for the time he gave to us and took away from his son, uh, who I think Tom's probably done quite a job, of, job to edit that out, was popping in and out of the room quite a lot during our conversation. But uh, yeah, my favourite was when he was using a bike pump to make it sound like he was farting. If I'm honest. <laughs> that did make me laugh. I have cut that out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was it was it was amusing. Um, no, it was good. It's uh, it's the start of some good things ahead. Next week, he's on film. 
Uh, we have Alex Lewington, uh, Saracens and Borderline England player, um, and his charity case, Jim Reeson, who uh, is friend and ex-school companion of Alex Lewington. Um, but yeah, it's just nice to give Jim something to do, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes with people like Jim, you just got to give him air time. Um, and it's almost like himself pressing the self-destruct button. So we'll see what happens. Um, so that should that should be good. That should be one to tell your mates about. If they want to listen to rugby stuff, the episode we've just done and next week are going to be top content. I mean, we've had good episodes before, um, but we've got, as John T put, our big boy pants on now. Um, big boy pants. Big boy pants for my doubly big boy pants now. Um, but what we thought we'd do, we thought we'd do a giveaway, didn't we, Phil? Why not? We've been a podcast for long enough now. We've not offered anything to you guys. No. So that's that's our it. main feedback from people. You offer us nothing. <laughs> 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 I listen, and there is nothing that you offer to me. So we're going to offer you something now. So it's quite simple. All you've got to do is like this post, the post, not this post, but the post where this podcast will be online. Share it to your story and tag two friends into the comments. Now, the prizes are big prizes, to be fair. You can either have a crate of Guinness, because we are unofficially sponsored by Guinness, or, go special, you can have a couple of bottles of Lamborghini. So, in the comment, you've got to write whether you would like Guinness or Lamborghini. So, there we go. I think, to be honest, Lamborghini's going to have more of a take-up than people appreciate. I've said it enough. I think you, you've almost become like the poster boy for Lamborghini. There wasn't many brands. Yeah. And yeah. to be fair, if there was any sort of individual that should be advertising Lamborghini, it is you. Yeah. I mean, they recently changed the bottles to having grave love hearts. Um, so if it isn't me, that has to, that isn't, but like I said, there's not enough brands out there that want someone like me. Um, so if you're listening, Lamborghini, I'm hoping the fact I've said you four times, it might pop up somewhere on the internet to your social media teams, Lamborghini. I'll tell you what, it'll be all over my search bars now. You said Lamborghini <laughs> four times. Yeah, me Alexa's starting to add it to me, Amazon order. Um, so yeah, like the post, share the post and tag teammates in it and uh, let us know whether you'd like the Guinness Lamborghini and we'll, uh, we'll get that dished out to you in the next few weeks. Should we give them a week or two weeks? Uh, let's do it before next Saturday. So we will pick a winner next friday oh. when we're doing the outro oh for, and then we can say the winner in the outro and then keep people in. listening all the way through to the outro you have to everyone's a winner you have to and maybe i'm going to put in the post for this one listen to the end it's worth it there's a little surprise and if you are the surprise will be sent to you in your dms no it won't be joke. um so phil uh any wise words not this week uh uh, I've spent them all. Spent them all. Spent up on wise words, and I uh, am appreciative of that because it is snowing. So I thought there was going to be don't eat yellow snow. Um, but there we go. I'll continue to do that. Now, uh, have a good uh, week, Phil, and enjoy. Bye bye.